Uh, it's Sanjay Gupta uh, doing this Facebook Live. Um, thank you for joining us. We got a town hall tonight uh, as well on CNN. Anderson and I are going to be hosting and giving you a lot of knowledge, I think, with regard to what's happening with coronavirus. And uh, uh, I'll talk to you about that a little bit more in a bit. That's at 8 o'clock um, uh, this evening. A lot has happened in the last week since we last sat down and talked like this. Um, I think it's 95% of the country now is under a, a stay-at-home order. Basically means, you know, you stay at home and, and try and social distance yourself, physically distance yourself from people. And I've really been struck by how quickly people have started to understand this and, and really abide by it. I think it's, it's very impressive. I mean, the country's going through a lot right now, and I, worth, I think it's worth just taking a moment and... and commenting on, on how quickly we've adapted to this. I mean, you couldn't have imagined two months ago the position that we would be in right now. You would have probably thought there's no way. Uh, when the NBA season got suspended and canceled, I think people were really shocked back then. And now these types of developments um, seem understandable, predictable, and people are much more amenable to them than I think they, they were originally. So, you know, I think there's, there's, that, that, that's some good news. There are certainly still places in the country where they're not following these lockdown or, or stay-at-home sort of orders. They haven't, or, they haven't actually abided by them or ordered them in certain states still, which is too bad um, because, you know, it's just not scientific. I think the science has been really clear on this, and I think what the science is also clear about is that if you don't follow these stay-at-home orders, um, it's likely to lead to more people becoming infected by this, more people than needing to access the medical establishment and putting hospitals in a situation where they could be overwhelmed and putting healthcare workers at risk. So I won't belabor this point because we've talked about it so much here, but let me just say that, that if you stay at home and, and abide by these things, you're, you're doing it not just for your own physical health, you're doing it for your family's physical health, you're doing it for the people you love, your community, it's not just about you. We're dependent on each other right now. And some people are going to rise to that, and, and some people are not. Some communities are going to rise to that, and some communities will not. Um, so, you know, we have to decide right now who we are. I think uh, as far as knowledge, information, education about this, hopefully we're providing enough. We certainly want to take your questions to see if there's things about this that still don't make sense. A couple, couple just quick more points before I get to your questions. The headlines this week, one of the things that a lot of people paid attention to was these models that come out that sort of predict um, how much of an impact this is going to have on the United States. And many of you who've been paying any attention to this at all probably have heard that um, 100 to 240,000, I believe, in the one model um, could die from this. It's sad, sad, obviously, and I don't want to overall, uh, you know, uh, focus on the grim statistics because I think we still have a way to act about this. But I want to say that, uh, you know, when you look at those models, um, they're really predicated, they're based on the idea that by Friday, I guess tomorrow, the entire country is, is on a stay-at-home order. That means that every state has done this and, and that we as a nation are now doing this. That's the way you stop the transmission or at least start to stop the transmission of this virus. If we don't do that, then as terrible as these numbers are, the 100, 200,000 people who could die, I dare say that they, they could be even worse. So again, you know, really uh, focus on, on, on thinking about why this is, what you're contributing by, by listening to these orders. And again, I know many of you who are watching are probably, you know, you understand this, but maybe, maybe there's people in your life who don't. And th this is a good time to give them a call and just maybe talk, you know, in an honest way in a, in a empathetic way, because this is hard for people. I mean, I don't think that people who aren't abiding by this are, are necessarily doing it to be bad people. I think maybe they don't understand, uh, and it's just really tough. So I think we all need to be um, humble, and we need to be empathetic in terms of how we talk about this. Another, another headline you probably heard was that there is evidence we've known for some time of, of what is called asymptomatic spread. And what that means is that you don't have any symptoms, you're not coughing or sneezing or feeling like you're sick, and yet you're still able to spread the virus. Uh, a letter was written last night that said the virus could be spread through breathing 
and talking, which is exactly what asymptomatic spread is. We've known this for, for some time. So that raises this discussion about masks and whether or not you should wear masks. And um, I have a few thoughts on that. I, th I think that it may be time now where we actually think about wearing masks when we go out into public, but not necessarily for the reasons that you might immediately think. Um, as people have said, um, the healthcare workers, first of all, need their surgical masks and N95 masks. I'm not talking about those types of masks. I'm talking about a cloth mask or something that, you know, is not a medical grade mask, something that you might even make at home. But the reason you'd wear it is not so much to protect yourself from the virus as it is to, to operate under this belief that if you have the virus, it's in your nose or your mouth, wearing a cloth mask can decrease how much of the virus you're putting out into the environment. So you wear a mask not necessarily to protect yourself, you're wearing a mask to protect others. One thing I want to say real quick, um, I, I've been talking to my kids a lot about this. My kids uh, you know, heard me talk about this idea of the mask and, and for my youngest daughter decided to actually make me a mask. So there it is. She made me this mask. I think she did a really amazing job, but it kind of goes back to this idea again that um, we're, we're, we're sort of transforming ourselves so quickly. I never thought that my 11-year-old daughter would think about oh, I should make daddy a mask because, you know, there's this concern about him maybe having the virus and I want to help him protect other people. Just, it's, it's really sweet. And, you know, we're, we're really, um, I think, as I said, so many of us, so many people out there rising to the, to the occasion here. So let me try and take some of your, your questions. I know, oh, a lot of questions coming in. Um, so uh, Shante asks, uh, should we be out at parks with our children or older parents? Um, okay, so a couple of things in there. First of all, I don't think it's a problem to be outside. I go outside as well. If you know, I think it's good, in fact, to be outside uh, for your health, maybe your mental health as well. You've got to maintain your social distance outside, just like you do inside, as much as possible. If it's your family members and you're with them in, indoors, you know, generally as a family, then obviously that's going to be different. But people who you have not encountered, you just have to keep the distance. You know, six to nine feet is a is a good rule of thumb. With, you, with regard to older parents, I mean, you know, this is a, this is a question mark. I think that there is, there is clear evidence that there are some people who are more vulnerable than other people. Older people may be more vulnerable. I'm not saying they shouldn't go outside either. I'm saying it's particularly important for older people to really maintain that social distance. And when you go outside, it's not just the air you breathe. It's the surfaces you touch, the people you may come in contact with. So, you know, slow down, be mindful. If you do touch something, wash your hands. All the basics apply no matter where you are. Um, Chris asks, are Amazon pa packages safe? Um, yeah, I think for the most part they're safe. Here, here's how to think about it. I think um, we know uh, that viruses can live on surfaces, as we've been talking about. We know they can live on cardboard, for example. Uh, I think up to 24 hours. I'm sorry, up to, is it 24 hours, Amanda? Remember, 24 hours for cardboard, I think, up to, to three days for, for other surfaces. Um, so when we get packages, and we still do get packages at the house, we'll go ahead and, and basically open them out on the porch, leave the packaging, the outside packaging outside, bring the other things in, and then we may wipe the, wipe the surfaces down if it's a box or something that we've, uh, we've ordered. Um, and then later on, I'll go get the packages. Wash your hands. Again, here, here's what happens. You touch something that's, that's contaminated, and then you touch your face. If you touch something that's contaminated, you wash your hands, you're going to greatly reduce your chances of getting infected. So, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. Also, along those lines, um, I think there was a question about this, but this is not a foodborne illness. You're not going to get this virus by eating it. Your stomach acids, your, your digestive system will, will get rid of the virus. So that's not really the concern that it could be in the food you eat, but it could be on the packaging that the food comes in. That's why you wipe down the surfaces. That's why you wash your hands afterward. Um, as, uh, let's see here. Ansky asks, can you explain the incubation period for the virus? A lot of people do not understand what incubation period is. Great question. And, you know, it's funny because we do talk about things and then I, I'm, I'm not sure always that the terms make sense. So let's take a second and talk about incubation. Think of it like this. Incubation is a time period between when you might be exposed to the virus to the time when you might develop symptoms from the, for the virus. Okay between exposure and symptoms. 
And we know that, uh, you know, we, we worked with the number 14, 14 days as a sort of incubation period. We know that most people who are going to develop symptoms, and a lot of people don't, but people who do develop symptoms usually do it within five days. But we also know there's been evidence uh, that people have had the virus in their system for, I think, 28, 29 days. So it can vary is the point, but 14 days is a good measure. And if you think about 14 days, right now think about your own life. Can you account for how, you know, where you've been and all that in the last 14 days? Did you have a potential exposure during that time? Because if you did, then you have to sort of reset the clock each time you, you may have had a potential exposure. So incubation between exposure and symptoms, typically. Uh, Jazz Cantor asks, uh, when will COVID-19 peak in the United States or has it already? Um, well, you know, there's all sorts of models on this, uh, Jazz, you know, in terms of when it might peak, you're hearing different things. A lot of them suggest that the, it'll be sometime this month, the month of April, uh, middle of the month, third week of the month. But a couple things to keep in mind. One is that you're probably going to have several peaks because different states have implemented these stay-at-home orders at different times. And the ones that have not implemented it yet or did it more recently are probably going to have larger and later peaks of this virus. Um, so when we talk about a peak in the medical sense, what we're really trying to figure out is when is there going to be peak demand for hospital resources, hospital beds, ICU beds, uh, ventilators, things like that. And again, what we're hearing, it could vary, what we're hearing is sometime this month probably toward the end of the month. And then, of course, you've got to go down the other side of the curve. Peaking doesn't mean we're through this. It, it means that it's, it's going to get better, but we're not out of it yet. Um, let's see here. Mary Ellen asks, what over-the-counter meds can we take if we have coronavirus? Well, Mary Ellen, I, most of what we take for coronavirus right now is to treat symptoms. Okay, there's no particular antiviral, so you're absolutely right to ask about over-the-counter meds. Uh, a lot of people develop fever with this sort of uh, uh, virus, so, so taking a fever reducer, Tylenol is fine to take. You can also take ibuprofen. There's been some news uh, suggesting that ibuprofen is not uh, you know, good in these situations. Uh, World Health Organization looked into this, evaluated a bunch of the studies, and found that it's okay to take. I think the concern is that with uh, ibuprofen, it can weaken your immune system a little bit if you're somebody who's already got a weakened immune system. So maybe not the best choice if you already have a weakened immune system, but you, if you're healthy, ibuprofen would be no problem. And then you take other medications for your cough, if you have congestion, whatever it might be. Uh, let's see here. Diane asks, uh, how are you keeping your spirits up? Um, well, Diane, I am keeping my spirits up. I appreciate you asking the question. Um, you know, this is a tough thing, I think, for, for, for everybody in the world. Um, this is one of those few things that I think affects everybody in the world. I, I was talking to my kids the other day, and I said, um, I, always, I always thought from a science fiction perspective that if there was a, an attack from aliens or from another planet, that that would be scary, but it would also bring together the world in a way that uh, had never happened before. And this is sort of like that. I mean, we're all affected by this, and I think um, it's, 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 that part of it's terrible, but we're also seeing people come together in a way that I think is, is quite inspiring as well. So um, I think everyone should be optimistic. Everyone should be hopeful. I think we are going to get through this. We are. We're going to get through this. Don't know how long yet, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We just don't know how long the tunnel is now. So I'll keep talking to you. I'll keep talking to you about this. I'll keep giving you my podcast. I hope you get a chance to listen to it. Coronavirus uh, Facts versus Fiction. And then come join Anderson and I tonight um, and Dr. Fauci, 8 o'clock, uh, CNN. That's our town hall. Thanks for joining us.